The Triassic is famous for having very, very normal animals, like giant meat-eating land crocs, and giant plant-eating land crocs, and long-necked fish eaters, and long-necked sauropodomorphs, and very normal animals like Vinclevia, or the Drapanosaurs, or the Trilophosaurs, which all of these were clearly very normal animals. We have things just like them today. Okay, maybe that's a little bit of an extreme. In fact, the Triassic is well known for being the opposite of normal, and that's because it came just after the Permian-Triassic extinction, in which up to 75% of life on land died out, and that meant there was a lot of ecospace for different things to evolve different body forms. And that brings us to Longisquama, another one of these very strange animals, and it wasn't particularly massive. In fact, in the formation it's from, the Madigan formation, there's certain insects that would have looked a lot like praying mantises that would have been even larger than it. The name Longisquama, though, gives away the strangest feature that it has, though, because long is fairly straightforward, long, and squama being for the scales, and specifically these long scales or structures that it had along its back, and it's really hard to know for sure what they were for, but hopefully by understanding the Madiga information we might be able to figure it out. Unfortunately for our one good fossil of Longisquama, it's really hard to know exactly what was happening with this animal, because it's broken in half near the bottom of the body, and the long scales on the back didn't preserve a lot of textures on top of them. That said, there are some other fossils that have been assigned to Longisquama, which show a much more interesting pattern of different structures on these long structures along its back, if they do indeed belong to Longisquama. Again, it's really hard to know because we just have a handful of those other structures. We don't have it associated with the skeleton that we can say is Longisquama, which is really rough to try and identify it with. One of the most interesting things about the isolated fossils of these odd structures is that they do have that patterning though, and it does actually resemble somewhat feathers, which means potentially Longisquama could be related to things like the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs, both of which had integument coverings that were similar to feathers or were feathers in the case of the dinosaurs. The pterosaurs and their pycnofibers are still up for debate as to whether or not they were or weren't feathers or something evolved separately. Unfortunately for us, like I mentioned, the Longisquama fossil that's there is actually broken in half, and especially the back end is missing. And one of the best traits for understanding if Longisquama could have been closely related to the dinosaurs or the pterosaurs would have been its ankle structure. And because it doesn't have that proper structure, or at least not preserved, we don't know exactly where it would belong in that family tree. We need to look at other structures and potentially again see how the Madigan formation formed and how it would have been living. The Madigan Formation shows a really interesting time in Kyrgyzstan's history, and that's largely because before the Madigan started being deposited, it was actually a shallow sea, and we have the rocks in Kyrgyzstan today to prove it. But also, we have some of the mountains that were lifted up by the collision of Sumeria into Kyrgyzstan, and during this collision, it actually lifted many of those marine sediments up into mountains in Kyrgyzstan. And we can actually see this through the Madigan Formation, which starts out as a very shallow marine basin, and then turns into more of a delta-type environment as you start getting more mountains and uplift forming. And finally, you start getting more streams and alluvial fans coming off of mountains. And finally, towards the end of it, you actually get a large lake that developed in these mountains. And it would have been a fairly cold lake, potentially even snowing during the winters. The uplift of these mountains, though, also would have provided a lot of new habitat. And with the ocean right there, it would have also provided a lot of humidity and rain, leading to a very nice, deep, freshwater lake. And that's what it seems like is actually the case of why there's so many great fossils from the Madigan Formation. Because this lake would have been so deep that oxygen really couldn't get to the bottom levels of it very well. So if an animal died, was washed into this lake, and then sank to the bottom, it could be preserved very well. In fact, one great example of this is with insects, because insects don't really have a lot of hard parts, so they fossilize very poorly. But there's over 500 species of fossil insects known from the Madigan Formation. So it's done really, really well, and it's just unfortunate that the one fossil of Longisquama we have from there isn't preserved quite as well. But of course, fossil animals weren't the only thing getting washed in. Part of the reason we have really solid evidence for this being a mountain environment is because we understand that there would have been those oceanic sediments deposited down before Samaria actually crashed into Kyrgyzstan. And then those sediments got lifted into those mountains, and then they actually tumbled out of those mountains, and occasionally you can find pieces of them in this fossil lake. So we know what was happening here geologically based on many lines of evidence. 
because you can also look at some of the different plants that were there and go, okay, yeah, this probably would have been a slightly cooler environment than most of the other parts of the world, just because it would have been more in the mountains. It's honestly kind of funny though, because it mirrors modern day Kyrgyzstan, which formed when India, the subcontinent, crashed into Southern Asia, and that lifted these mountains back up, including the Madigan Formation, but as a new set of mountains. And you could honestly potentially compare the lake at Madigan to the modern lake in Kyrgyzstan, Isik Kul, which is in the Tian Shan Mountains. And that would be the environment that Wanjosquama would have found itself living in. And it's hard to say exactly how it does fit in there because it is so partial. And the long spines have a couple different ideas as to how they could have functioned. Some of these ideas have been fairly generic. Potentially it was something actually allowing it to be able to camouflage itself better. Essentially it helped blend in like different kinds of trees and large fronds from cycads that would have lived in the environment. Unfortunately though, we also have plant fossils from the Madigan Formation, as as far as we know, there was no plant there with the kind of distinctive hooked back hockey stick shape that we do see in Longisquama. There's also an idea that they could have been for display, and with the isolated ones, I do kind of like this idea, because if it is something that's actually able to be shed like a scale on a lizard or something, it could drop those scales and only grow them during certain times of the year for display purposes. It's not entirely known how likely that would be, but there are things you could do for both of these, and that's mainly using the scanning electron microscopes to try and see if there's any melanosomes preserved. This has already been used to identify colors in certain fossil organisms, and that's just based on the shape of the melanosomes and comparing it to modern day animals' melanosomes. It's also really important though to understand that not all of the melanosomes get preserved with the same frequency, so there might be a bias in some of those colorations, and depending on what color Solange Squama was, they may not be preserved at all. Now while I do think display is probably the most likely case, there is one idea that I do think is a bit more interesting, and that is if it was related to things like the pterosaurs and the dinosaurs, maybe it was gliding. And it's going to be really hard to show that with just the one fossil that we do have, however some researchers have suggested that maybe these structures were paired, essentially it would have had another set of them on the other side of the organism, and then it could flatten them out and glide like some kinds of draco lizards do today. This would also make sense if it's found to be closely related to another one of the organisms that lived in the Madigan formation, Charoviptorix, which I already did a video on Charoviptorix's relative Oshemek from Poland, so you can look at that video if you want more on those organisms and their weird gliding wings. However, it's still important to understand that there should be other features to identify what this animal is, and one of those for example would be a mandibular fenestra. And that's specifically for archosaurs, meaning potentially again putting it closer to dinosaurs and pterosaurs, but also maybe crocodilians. And the mandibular fenestra is on the lower jaw, this hole there. And that actually helps muscles attach to the upper part of the skull to help power the bite. And in its initial description, it was said to have had this kind of fenestra. Unfortunately then, other researchers looked at it and went, ah, we think that's just damage to the fossil, and not an actual structure that it would have had in life or at least it's too indeterminate to say for sure, which means saying for sure that yeah, it was an archosaur really isn't the most practical thing to do, unfortunately. And other researchers found more evidence against the archosaur idea, meaning again, further away from things like dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilians. And what they found is that the teeth appear to not be in sockets. That's something you do find in things like the archosaurs, but actually in lizards, they don't sit in sockets, they actually just sit kind of on the inside of the jaw. They're not actually in a hole in the jawbone. But that's really just comparing it to modern groups. There's also fossil groups it could have been a part of, including the avicephalians, meaning they have bird-like skulls, but they really weren't closely related to birds. Instead, you're going to be looking at things like Solorosaurus for this, which would have been around during the Permian and would have been gliding around to different trees. There have also been a number of studies in the last few years that really were looking at Solorosaurus in better detail. And so with any luck, someone will be able to go along and look at Longisquama and make a better comparison to Solorosaurus to see if they were related. And it's hard to know for sure. Again, as far as we know, things like Solorosaurus didn't have giant display spines down their back. And again, that also means we need to know for sure if they were display spines or something else in Longisquama. And I, again, think that's possible with the right tools maybe some chemical testing and some scanning electron microscopes, but unfortunately right now the fossil is in Russia, which isn't funding its paleontology as much as I would like, and they're also doing other things that I would not like them to be doing. And as for other fossils of it potentially being found, 
This fossil comes from Kyrgyzstan, which doesn't have a giant economy, so there's not many people actually doing this kind of really hard work in the Madian formation. And when they are, it's largely people who are looking for insects, because again, 500 insects are incredible. That's so many insect fossils, it's just almost mind-blowing. So with all that said, Longisquamo is a wildly, wildly interesting animal. And unfortunately, we just don't know a lot about it right now, and I wish I did, because that way I could give you a better answer for what the hell it was. As opposed to just, it was some kind of reptile, and a weird one at that. So hopefully, eventually, that means peace will win out, and people can start worrying about paleontology more than conflicts.